Hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar. My name is Andrew Townsend. I'm here with eLearning Brothers. Today, we will be talking about micro learning and the learning life cycle. This webinar will be recorded. If you need a copy of it, you'll be able to find it on our blog later in the week. We will also uh, send a copy of this out to everyone who is registered. You'll get a copy of that later today. If you have questions during the webinar, we'll be ready to answer your questions in the questions panel. Looks like some of you have already found that questions panel. So uh, please use that to communicate with us and participate in the webinar, and we'll try to get to as many of your questions as we can. Just so you know, one of the things we like to do after the webinar is try to follow up as soon as possible. Sometimes it's just to get feedback. Most of the time, we would like to touch base and see if anyone needs some one-on-one -on -one clarification about our webinar topics after the fact. All right, so to talk to us about the, uh, the learning life cycle, we have Richard Harmon, a senior custom solutions consultant with us today. Uh, also here with eLearning Brothers. Thanks for joining uh, us, Richard. And uh, without further ado, I'll go ahead and turn the time over to you. Okay. Well, I appreciate everybody taking some time out of their day to learn a little bit about and have some discussion on micro learning, the learning life cycle. But there are a number of reasons why um, I've chosen this topic um, and, and, and for, a, for a webinar. Um, first off, technology has evolved and learner um, learners have changed. Um, technology has evolved to the point of being able us to um, provide content or learning experiences at point of need or just in time more easily. Um, and learner preferences as to how they consume content uh, or solve problems has changed. 87% um, of um, adult Americans have said that they use the internet to learn and it's easier for them, it makes it easier for them to learn. And 70% of workers say that the first thing they do when they try and solve a learning or a job challenge or to learn something other job is they go to Google. They don't turn to the learning and development organization to, to solve immediate problems. And so what we want to look at is micro learning in the context of what I'm calling the learning life cycle. And the reason why that term learning life cycles come into play will become apparent as we talk through this, this webinar. Um, to begin, um, let's look at what we're going to be talking about very briefly so that you have some context. Um, we're going to look at the context of, of, of micro learning in, in an ecosystem of, of learning and development. We'll also talk about definitions. We'll get your input on what you think defines micro learning, has multiple definitions. We'll then look at a framework um, as to how micro learning can be implemented in an organization. Um, historically, in the past, Learning development, especially e-learning, has had long courses, large cl long classrooms, and micro-learning is sort of the antithesis of that. And so how do we adapt a micro-learning strategy into how people learn? Um, we'll also look at some misconceptions about uh, micro-learning, uh, when to consider it from a content and a business perspective and an audience perspective, and also when to be careful of using it. Uh, it's not a solution for everything. And then we'll also look at a sort of a case study of how a particular company or organization used micro learning um, in their rollout of the curriculum related to branding um, and the brand and branding of the organization that experience. And then we'll look at what I'm referring to as experiential micro learning, um, which is less content centric. When we think of micro learning, we think of content, small chunks and things like that. But we'll, we'll look at an alternative approach um, to, for implementing a micro learning. Uh, strategy. But before we begin, let's let's do a polling question to kind of get a sense of what you your perception is as to what micro learning means. And I'm going to have Andrew put up a polling question and what is the def what definition describes micro learning to you? And and there is no right answer, it's just a question of um, your perceptions as to how these things. I'll, I'll let people respond to that and kind of get a sense of where people are across the spectrum for what micro learning is. Excellent. So that poll is up on the screen right now. It looks like most of you have found that you can just click right on the screen uh, to participate there. Um, and a good chunk of you are agreeing on what this, uh, what this can be defined as. I'll give you guys a couple more seconds to vote here. Uh, maybe three more seconds. Three, two, no pressure. Two, one, and here we go. All right, so here's those results. 54% of our audience says bite-sized chunks just in time. 39% says short, focused, and easily accessible. And then 4% said targeted objective, focused act, uh, focus activity. 2% said learning objective, learning activity, et cetera. Nobody said the last one on the job activity, evidence of performing or coaching. Thank you. So let's, let's look at 
micro learning in the context of a larger uh, learning ecosystem. And the reason why I wanted to share this is because sometimes people tend to think it's a silver bullet for things. And in reality, it's only one small component of a large learning ecosystem. And so we want to make sure we have that context because it isn't necessarily a solution for all things. And we're going to, we're going to discuss where it has relevance and where it may not be. And this sh shows you where it fits in the larger picture. And, and micro learning is sort of a broad term. So for example, instructor led training, you can have micro learning in an, an instructor led training course. It doesn't have to be an online experience. Um, but this kind of gives you a sense of where things are in the, in the larger picture. The other thing is, is I, I wanted, and I just picked one of the definitions, I, um, and I appreciate your feedback as far as your perceptions, but this is one of many, one of many definitions is it's micro learning is typically a, a single performance objective. You've got a, a single activity, a learning activity, and then a, a single outcome, what you're, what you're trying to either accomplish or measure or have them learn. And this, that becomes a micro learning experience. Um, let's do one more um, polling question. Is your organization using microlearning? I like to get a sense of where people are. Um, either they're interested in it, they're using it, and, and we can get feedback from you as far as your experiences and things like that. So let's do the polling question. Excellent. That poll is up on the screen here. It looks like a lot of you have started voting already. We'll give you guys a couple more moment, a uh, couple more minutes. Is your organization using micro uh, learning? No, not sure, not currently, but interested. We plan to implement in the next three to six months or, yeah, we, we use the heck out of it way too much. Um, we'll give you guys about three more seconds to vote. Last chance, three, two, one. All right, and here's those results. 37% um, of our audience isn't currently using it, but they are interested. 32% of the audience plans to implement in the next three to six months. 20% says they, they overuse it. And 11% says that they're not sure. In reality, that fourth the fourth answer, yes, but too much, is probably poorly worded because it, you, you may be using it, but it may not be too much. And so that's my apologies for categorically making a poorly worded question. So let, let's look at um, micro learning in the context of what I'm referring to as a learning life cycle. Um, in order to accommodate current learning audiences' preferences for consuming content in smaller chunks, just in time when they want it, um, when we think of a of a 60 minute course or two hour course, um, we've div we've divided um, learning up into different phases, and the reason why this has been done is because it lends itself to, to creating solutions that fulfill the need or the goal of that particular phase. So, for example, learner readiness is where instead of just launching into a course and in, in, in a 60 minute course or a two hour course, you may have all of these things present, but because of the length of it, um, sometimes People get lost in the experience, um, they tune out and things like that. And by making it a micro learning experience, you have the opportunity to get the maximum benefit of the, the intent or purpose of the activity to guide them to the next phase of the learning life cycle. So learner readiness, um, this is where they discover the why. There may be an emotional connection or there may be identification of a performance gap or committing to change, cultural change and things like that. It's more of an affective experience versus an information experience. Once you've readied them for learning, then you go into to a discovery and acquisition phase where they may be presented with opportunity to learn new knowledge and skills, have contextual practice, apply what they've learned and receive feedback. And then on the job transfer is where you actually are out of the classroom and you're taking the information that you've gained in an experience and applying it to your job. So there may be just in time performance support, experiential learning, follow up coaching and mentoring job aids, and then the section below, micro, micro learning solution components are potential uh, training activities that could lend to achieving the objectives of these particular phases of the learning cycle. So Richard, there's some concern that with your mouse hovering over the UI, we may be missing something in that very bottom uh, uh -oh. section. Let's, let's zoom out just a little bit. Can everybody see everything now? Yes, that's great, thank okay. you. Okay, so. And, and what ends up happening is, is technology as well as solution design comes into play in all these different phases of the learning life cycle. Um, let's do another polling question to kind of get a sense of where people are, it, those who are using, learning, uh, using uh, microlearning. What form does your microlearning take? And you can check all that apply because microlearning can take all kinds of forms.
All right, it looks like uh, this polling question is only accepting one. So while you won't be able to uh, click on all that apply, you'll just need to pick on the one that fits you best. Okay. Uh, but uh, <laughs> we'll understand also that, that you, may, you may have multiple versions here. Um, we'll give you guys a couple more moments to vote here. E-learning and mobile delivery, video and motion graphics, storytelling, interactive infographics, gamification, experiential activities, evidence, performance, coaching, things like that. All right, so here's those results. Looks like 57% of the audience is using e-learning and mobile delivery. 26% of the audience is using video and motion graphics and storytelling. And then 17% spread between the other three. Okay. That's interesting. Experiential activities that you listened listed was the definition of an experiential activity and things like that was actually not chosen as a definition. So some of you, there was a little bit of incongruence there, depending on who answered that. So let's look at some misconceptions regarding microlearning. Uh, microlearning is not a replacement for what I'll call regular training. Um, um, it's not always a good place to start. It has specific purpose and specific needs. Microlearning is not just chunking up 30 hours of training into five and 10 minute segments. And it's not solely a quicker, a quicker cheaper training option. One of the paradoxes of microlearning is, is when you have an hour long learning experience, it's very content centric and heavy. And when you go into microlearning, content becomes secondary. Actually, the design of the experience becomes more important. And actually investment in design for that short experience becomes really critical. There will be content in the experience potentially depending on the strategy that you use, but design becomes really more important. When you've, when you've got two to three minutes or five minutes or 10 minutes with a learner, it's really important that they stay engaged and that it has relevance and meaning and timeliness um, to the learner. So what, what is microlearning? Um, microlearning is part of a strategic plan. It's, it's not just one-off courses that you wanna make shorter. Um, you could even compare microlearning to marketing. Marketing, when you think of marketing, you think of campaigns where you've got a series of messages that go out or a series of interactions and touch points with a particular customer or consumer. And microlearning is the same. Um, you, you develop a campaign um, for your touch points and, and the content and the behaviors the outcomes that you want in, in your plan for delivering microlearning. Uh, microlearning is driven by need, uh, learner needs, pre preferences for consuming content, uh, business needs. It's driven by interest. When I say interest, I'm meaning the learner interest. And interest can be determined by uh, the length of time for the training, uh, the timeliness of it. Is it just in time? It's relevance, it's ease of access. Uh, one, one question that I have that's really not a polling question, and you're welcome to chat on this, is a lot of the people I talk to, they talked about implementing microlearning, and they have a learning management system where it's user unfriendly enough that it takes them longer to access a course than it has, does to actually go through the course. I'm curious if some of you have experiences with learning management systems that are really not conducive to a microlearning environment because it's so hard and unwieldy to get information. And you're welcome to chat, and I'm curious if we're getting any responses if it resonates with anybody. All right. The the general consensus here as people are chatting in is yes. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, that's another not one is uh, our LMS is absolutely not conducive uh, to micro micro learning. Another is uh, perhaps there's a formula to follow that we just haven't found yet. Um, another is to open and access course content, very difficult. Ours is clunky and we use SharePoint instead. Um, can only be accessed at work. That's another problem. People aren't able to learn uh, outside of the, the workplace. Um, working with the LMS to build micro learning uh, from our intranet. Um, the environment is managed by someone outside of our training department, so timeliness is a huge issue. Can definitely, definitely see that. Uh, we don't have single sign-on, so the time needed to log in sometimes exceeds that of the microlearning content. Yeah. So lots of different problems for lots, lots of different organizations. Um, it's definitely a struggle. Yeah, and we'll we'll look at some obstacles as well to microlearning. Let's let's look at um, when to consider microlearning um, from a content perspective, from a business context, and from an audience. Um, 
because micro learning is short, it lends itself to rapidly changing content. Um, theoretically, it should take less time to build potentially so that um, new product knowledge comes out, things like this. Um, it lends itself to rapidly changing content. Also, when uh, repetition or practice is required over long periods of time, I'll share with you an example later on in a case study where a client actually built an app that became sort of a gaming type experience, but helped with identifying correct branding of their, their collateral marketing materials. You know, it also comes into play when they sort of need a minimal intervention that yields maximum results. That's sort of this leverage tipping point is what, where can we get a lot of bang for a buck um, with the learners um, for um, desired business outcomes. From business context, you've got, again, dynamic, rapidly changing context, um, large scale niches with different needs of different users and learners, different jobs and role descriptions. Um, so not everybody's having to take everything. It's very job and role specific. It's very short and pointed. Can you elaborate a little bit on what you mean by not content centric? Um, yes, that's a really good question. So when we think of um, learning, we, we tend to focus on content itself versus the actual experience or the activity of performing your job. And, and, and I'll address this a little bit later on uh, with, with an example. Um, when, you, when you think of experiential learning, experiential learning would be a classic example of micro learning that may or may not have content associated with it. So you may have a, a, a proficiency path or a path to proficiency that says, for example, I was assigned to this webinar. That is a task. And, and, and so I went through the process of preparation and I went, I Googled things, I went through literature that I had, and that was actually a learning experience for me. Um, and then I shared it with people, I got feedback on it. Um, there, there was no training course. There was no e-learning that I went through in order to prepare for this webinar. It was all an experiential learning experience. And so a combination of going to reference material that I had, past experience, feedback from other people, um, and content from the internet, as well as our own internal content here at eLearning Brothers. So um, an activity or task can be a learning experience, even though there's, quote, no content in it, per se. Now, content may come into play as if you need help, but ultimately, there is content-centric or centered, and that's most of what micro-learning is to most people, but, but that's formal learning, if you will. When you get into experiential learning, we're actually doing your job and you're learning while you're doing your job, that's what I'm referring to experiential learning, where it's maybe not content centric. And you, you reference resources and reference material to learn versus a course. That's the difference, I, that type of thing. Good question. Um, when should you be careful when looking at micro learning? Um, when you've got complex inter interconnected topics, which are vital, where the sequence is vital, um, I had a client who converted a 40-hour instructor-led course, a self-study course, to 20 hours of e-learning, and he, and he wanted to make it micro-learning. And the content was very complex, very interconnected, and it didn't lend itself to five and 10-minute segments. Now, it, it could be broken up into smaller segments from a just-in-time performance support perspective as reference material, but to actually teach them for the first time, it did not lend itself to a micro-learning experience. Sometimes you may have certification requirements or even compliance requirements where you, people are required to sit through 60 minutes of content. Um, and, and customers are figuring out ways to incorporate a micro-learning strategy even though time limits are required. They're, just, they're, they're breaking up their learning objectives into smaller chunks and increasing the design to still meet the requirement of, of time-based training, those types of things. Um, from a business context, um, when things are controversial, it requires significant context where you've got to share a lot of information with people to be able to understand the context of a, a particular business setting may not lend itself to, to micro learning. And anytime you have social relationships that need to be fostered, um, and unless you have the ability to connect people synchronously in, in a micro learning experience, it may not lend itself to that. Um, so you need to be careful in that particular area. Um, Let's look at a, let's get more specific and look at an actual example of, of an organization that went through a rebranding process and decided to change themselves culturally so that the brand wasn't just colors, logo, things like that, but they actually changed how they did business with people. Because ultimately that's what brand meant. 
and, and they used, they developed an entire curriculum and they use the learning life cycle, you see learner readiness, discovery and acquisition, and on the job transfer to introduce this curriculum to the learning audience. Because this, this branding curriculum was not just for marketing department, it's for the entire organization, tens of thousands of employees. And so they wanted to figure out a way to get people engaged in the content and to engage into um, the fact that they had an impact on brand. And so they, they created a motivational video um, because they wanted to create learner readiness. They wanted to kind of have people have an aha moment before they actually even like, started consuming content. And then they wanted to have practice activities and gamification to begin to expose them to the things that were really critical to help them understand the importance of brand um, and the customer experience because brand ultimately became the customer experience. And so I'm gonna have Andrew play a video that and we'll just listen to a few maybe a minute of or less to kind of give you a sense of how they introduce this brand curriculum to their audience. Brand is really about how the world experiences a company. You know, it's about the, the holistic identity of a company in the world. What do you stand for? Who are you? Not just what do you look like and, and what do you make? Brand means to me, it's the, the way that we talk to our customers, it's the way we show up to our customers. For me, brand is more than just a logo and uh, a commercial that you might see on TV, but brand is really about what you stand for. I think about the word brand in a general sense. For me, it brings up an image of a word cloud, a whole lot of words, but for me, one dominant word right in the middle, and that's promise. A brand is... So what you saw was an interview of a series of employees. Some of them were marketing people, some of them weren't marketing people, expressing their opinions about what brand meant. And ultimately what it came down to, and we ended with a man saying, you've got this word cloud. In the middle of that word cloud is a promise. And the promise is, is what you're gonna deliver to the consumer. Not only just deliver as far as product or service, but what the experience is gonna be like. And they introduced the, 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 the curriculum this way. And the next thing they did is they said, okay, We've got tens of thousands of employees who may not even have customer contact. How do we get them involved and engaged with the fact that they impact the brand? And so they began to introduce the concept of a value chain where you had a salesperson who had customer contact, then you had a sales engineer, if you will, who supported that salesperson, and you may have had a call center who supported the sales engineer, with, and then a marketing department who supported this call center and the engineer with training collateral. And what they wanted to do is they wanted them to understand that the customer experience was absolutely critical to the brand. And so they, the next activity they did is they wanted to, people to understand that they impacted the brand. And so they went through, this is an interactive infographic. And what they did is, is they had the opportunity, and this took like five minutes or so, to self-select attributes about themselves, where they worked in the organization, uh, what their functional area was, whether they're a manager, whether they're customer facing, and then a whole bunch of seemingly disparate information about social organizations they're involved with, friends they had, clubs, religious organizations, communities, devices they owned. All this information was gathered about the individual. And what they wanted at the end of this is they actually quantified based upon the profile of this learner the impact that they had on the brand, the number of people that they actually impacted. And the reason they wanted them to understand this is in, in a former life, when a person had a bad experience with a customer, let's say you went into Sears and you didn't get customer service, the person would say, I'm never going back there again. That was the end of it. Nothing happened. They lost a customer. Nowadays, when a person engages with a company and their experience is good or bad, they go out on Facebook, they go out on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and, and there's this exponential effect of the experience on the brand. And so this activity, all it was was something that said, it created an aha moment. Oh my gosh, I had no idea I impacted the brand. Suddenly the, the, the training content that they were required to take or had the opportunity to take became relevant to them because they began to realize they were part of the value chain. Because in reality, the, the customer of the sales engineer was the salesperson. How he supported him impacted his ability to have a positive experience with the end customer who brought their product and service. The other thing that they did was is they, they, they focused on what they call the net promoter score, NPS. This is a marketing term that it, it, it's a quantitative measure of a qualitative experience. And they wanted people to understand that because they're part of this value chain, um, everybody in the chain 
has an experience. And depending on upon how the experience is, ultimately impacts what the end experience is for the consumer who buys their products and services. So they created this gaming experience where um, people were identified as promoters, they were neutral, or they were detractors based on their experience. And they had this visual display. Let, let me just back it up so you can kind of see what they're experiencing, if, if I can stop it quickly enough. Well, we'll wait till the next one. So you, you have a bunch of smiley, you have a bunch of faces on the screen. It's a very iconic game, but these faces represent people who love the company or neutral or people who don't like the company. And what they did is they would click on each of these and when they clicked on them, they were presented with a, an experience, a customer experience. And then they were given an opportunity to help them, get help or do nothing. And each, and these were very nuanced experiences and they were different they were different customers within the value chain. And then depending on how they respond, they saw a physical effect of people changing from detractors to neutral to promoters or just the opposite, depending upon how they responded. And this was timed and this was scored. And it, and it was just this iterative gaming activity where they had the opportunity. And what was interesting, this was a voluntary activity in the organization and it became a viral event in the sense that um, individuals started competing against each other there was leaderboards, departments were against departments, and they had something like 270,000 completions within the organization. And that's all well and good because it was an engaging activity. It was a micro learning activity. But what really was critical was is after they introduced this, the video and their brand impact as an individual based on their profile and then went through the gaming activity, the NPS score, um, they measured their actual net promoter score, which is the perception of the customer in the marketplace, and it went up 5%. So what they were doing is they were increasing the level of awareness with the employee across the organization as to how they treat the customer and, and to determine who their customer is to create the customer experience. So their brand didn't become a visual thing, it became an affective, emotional, and connecting thing for the learner. Questions? So there's a couple questions. Um, on this uh, this principle, um, first of all, people really want to know: Did eLending Brothers develop this one? No, this was developed by uh, for another company, another organization that I worked with. Yeah, okay. but it could be developed by eLending Brothers. It just wasn't. Sure. Yeah. Um, another one is: Was there any resistance from the staff about sharing this kind of personal information? Um, it was not identifying. Um, the answer was no. There, there wasn't. Yeah. And, and, and it was optional. Yeah, that wasn't required. In fact, let me let me show you the, the next example of their uh, e-learning experience. So everything in there, there was no, how, how do I word this? If you, if you noticed, it was generic information, um, but it was associated with a login. Um, and that information was kept private within the organization. That's a good question. The, the other area that, was part of the sort of their learning life cycle, personalizing the experience and adapting it to their needs is, and this isn't specifically micro learning centered, but it contains micro learning in this experience. So they build a portal, they build a, a site, it's sort of brand central, if you will, where everything associated with the brand from a collateral perspective and, and a policy and a procedure perspective was contained in it. And, and there was also education. This is where the micro learning came into play. So when a person logged in, they actually received a brand impact score that was different from the one I showed you earlier, which was an activity. This was based upon the courses they took, um, how timely they were in completing them, how well they did them, um, their functional area. They, they, they went through a mini profile again, and this one was you know, part of the, sort of their, their portal. And then based upon this information, they were served up recommendations for curriculum because none of it was absolutely required. And they could also check areas of interest that were important to them. And then when any kind of content was made available, it would push it out to them so they knew that there was a particular course or piece of collateral or reference material available to them. So based on their profile, they were told you, you, you can take brand, we recommend to you brand 101, brand impact infographic, those types of things. So they, these were optional, they weren't required. Also gave them the ability to access information very quickly, looking at their history, favorites, they could bookmark things. So. The, the purpose of this portal was is because they were taking sort of this micro learning approach, they wanted to make it really easy for people to get access to content really quickly. So they didn't have that frustrated learning management experience. experience. And in this particular case, it was integrated with their master data LMS, 
but the user experience, this was the face of the LMS to them as they went through the experience. And then, then the final area of the learning life cycle is we had learner readiness with videos and the interactive infographic. We had the gaming experience where they're able to actually practice um, low risk environment, interact with a customer. Then they personalized it with the portal and then they, they build action planners. So one of the courses they, whoops, my, my mistake, I clicked the wrong button. Um, they, they went through and, and within the course itself, they had the ability to input personal information that became a takeaway from them. So an online wizard, if you will, or action planner, where they actually typed in information, um, they could email it to themselves or become an action plan and take away from the course. So it sort of personalized it. So that once they left, quote, the classroom or the e-learning, they still had information that they could use um, to apply their principles used related to the brand. So that, that's just one example of how a particular client um, used the learning life cycle as well as micro learning to put together a sequence of activities to help change the culture of the organization. Let's do one more polling question. Um, what obstacles do you have for implementing micro learning? And you voiced some of those, but let's let's kind of get a sense of some of the challenges that you have. All right, so that information is up on the screen. Um, executive buy-in or budgeting, lack of micro learning strategy or don't know where to start, resource constraints, sustainability. And if you do need to click other, please let us know in the questions panel uh, what uh, what those problems are, what those challenges are. Give you guys a couple more moments to respond there. And uh, I'll go ahead and, and close it and share these out. So 46% of our audience says that they have a lack of micro learning strategy or don't know where to start. 26% says resource constraints, 17% executive buy-in or budgeting, 7% is sustainability, and uh, the the others uh, are coming in here. Content is too large and but absolutely has to be covered. Um, but there's several people also saying that there's there should be an all of the above <laughs> button. Yeah, good point. We're limited to five, unfortunately, so we had to be selective. That's good feedback. So what we're looking at now is what I'm referring to as an experiential approach to micro learning. And I gave you an example of myself of when I, when I started creating this webinar. Um, historically, micro learning has been very content centric. And someone asked a good question, well, how can it be otherwise? And, and, and the truth is, is when we think of micro learning, micro learning is part of formal learning. Classroom based instruction, e-learning, whatever form it takes, virtual classrooms, all those types of things, that's formal learning. And yet when a person leaves a classroom, they're not proficient yet necessarily. And so there's this black hole, if you will, is from the classroom experience to they're considered an expert or you know, super user or whatever, whatever you wanna call it. And that's basically informal learning and on the job experience. And so if most of the learning takes place out of the classroom, how do you use micro learning if you will, when you're outside the classroom. And that comes into play with experiential learning. Because in reality, I went through a series of micro learning activities in order to prepare this webinar. I didn't do it all at once. I didn't sit for an hour. I didn't have any guidance. I didn't have a, a course teaching me how to do it. I sort of, based on my own experience and what the objectives were and the things I wanted, I went out and gathered together, together everything. And they could have been tasks. They could have been said, okay, set an objective for what you want to accomplish in the presentation. Gather the media, where would I get, you know, all these different activities that help me perform my job. And so when, when you're doing your job, and, and then when I was doing my job and gathering it together, I actually shared with what, what I had created with another person. I gave them evidence of what I completed. And this happened to be a PowerPoint deck or, or a Prezi in this particular case. And I got feedback from people as to, you know, is it too complex? Is it too much text? You know, those types of things. And so I got feedback from a peer or a coach or a manager that allowed me to reflect on and make modifications to the PowerPoint deck or the, or the Prezi. And then I went back and repeated it and made, made changes to that. So that, that's, that's sort of experiential learning as a series of tasks that you do in order to complete your job. You gather evidence of it, whether it's documents or audio or video or pictures, whatever, 
you, you submit it feedback to a person and you get that feedback you reflect on it you implement changes you want to and then you go through that process now mine was informal and is experiential and i really wasn't reporting to a manager who wasn't signing me off on doing this but i was still using the same principles of this coaching and feedback cycle in order to get the best product possible and then this is how that cycle works in um let me zoom out just a little bit so you can see the whole picture so you've got informal micro learning where we might actually create five minute courses or 10 minute courses and then you've got informal and experiential micro learning where there may actually be courses embedded in this learning cycle once you've left the classroom, content that you can access just in time, but most of it's activities and tasks that I've been given, and I gather evidence of what I did. I get feedback from it, for either from peers or coaches, formally or informally. I reflect on it and make modifications to the point where it's considered, I'll call it market-worthy or customer-facing quality, um, and, and then I move on to the next task. And, and, and the point being, is, in my particular case, my proficiency is how can I be a better consultant, help people design custom solutions, be a source of credible information, a trusted advisor? Well, that means I have to learn certain things, and I have to have a certain experiences, and I have to have certain skills and competencies. And I, and I get those by going through this iterative cycle of these activities that give me the opportunity to develop that muscle memory knowledge, if you will, um, that comes from experience and learning and knowledge and practice intentional practice. So that that's how experiential and formal microlearning comes into play. It's less content centric. Content can be and usually is embedded in it, but it's usually resource material and sometimes it's courses and classes. So it's an example of a, a path. So so the question is is that if you're developing a microlearning strategy, do you do you want it to be content based? or do you want it to be proficiency-based? And that, that's a rhetorical question. I don't, I don't know the answer to that. But, but it is a conversation that needs to be had if you're gonna look at um, being successful in your strategy to implement microlearning. And, and, and I also, this isn't necessarily overly prescriptive, but it's, it, it's a possible path, and there's a lot of different ways of addressing this. I wanted you to get an idea of some of the questions and the information you might need or want in order to formulate a microlearning strategy campaign. The first thing you need to do, at least from my perspective, ones that are successful, is that it needs to be aligned with your business strategy, your organization's business. What, what, are, what is being me measured? What's the strategic emphasis in your organization that is touted in your annual report or whatever? And then it trickles down and it's mapped to and connected the dots to learning and development. So whatever you do, um, it needs to be aligned with um, the strategy of the organization because most likely you won't get funding for it if it isn't aligned with that strategy. Then you need to decide on whether you're going to be content centric or profi proficiency centric. Are you going to? And, and the, the reason why it's important to decide that because content centric means okay, everything's associated with content. We've got different roles, responsibilities, and jobs. We need to just align the content with those different jobs. Proficiency centric means you need to identify what does it mean to be proficient in a specific role. And once you've identified that proficiency, what is the path to get to that proficiency? And that path can be a combination of content or tasks or activities or skills or competencies that ultimately lead to that proficiency. Because depending upon the approach you take, you'll spend more time in content. Um, if you take the content approach, creating you know, e-learning courses, and if you go a proficiency approach, it'll actually be more experiential learning. And it'll be assigned to um, what it means to be competent in a particular role. Once you've identified the path you're going to do, you're going to identify those paths of proficiency or map the content that goes to the curriculum campaigns you're going to do, the rollout. I use the word campaign because L&D can learn a lot from marketing as far as being able to have a strategic campaign of information that's rolled out. And sometimes it's just messaging. Other times it's actually activities where people engage with content. And sometimes there's even assessing uh, knowledge and awareness and testing, those types of things. But that's the type of thing that needs to be decided. And then you map your content and your activities to your proficiency path or to your curriculum campaigns. Um, you need to identify an optimal platform for user experience. And then this is this is a real obstacle for some people because you know people aren't investing in new platforms. You've got to use your own existing LMS. How can you somehow make you know micro learning more accessible to the learner? Or or how can you automate you know this micro learning activity process, this coaching, you know? 
you know, I've given an activity of preparing a PowerPoint, I, I send evidence to somebody, they give me feedback, how can we automate that process so it's not too burdensome, uh, but it becomes a part of our normal workflow over day. Um, and then you begin the actual designing of the actual content itself, microlearning and messaging, um, the activities, uh, feedback guides for coaches, things like that. So just wanted to give you a sense of what the possibilities are, the types of questions that need to be answered in order to formulate a strategy. Let, let, let me pause for a minute and, and just let people ask questions if they would like to, and we can jump anywhere in, in the presentation or go places we haven't gone yet to answer any questions you may have. Sure, there's a question here that um, is a little bit confused about the content-centric versus proficiency-centric paths. Um, if you're going with proficiency, um, content is still a part of that path, right? So you're not, by saying that it's proficient, uh, proficiency centric does not mean you're abandoning content. Absolutely, it? you're not. And, and if if I could, I could show, I, I won't show now because I don't have access to it quickly, but usually a learning path will have maybe a course. And when I say a course, meaning you may be able to launch a, let's say a storyline course and it gives you some basic information. And you say, okay, go out and interview a customer and gather information from them. So that's an actual task that you do. And then within that task, there actually may be steps associated with it. So there's learner guidance as to how to complete the task. But then when you complete the task, you actually gather evidence of what you did. You either put together an outline of what you did or you record the conversation. And then you send that conversation to a coach or a mentor, if you will, um, who gives you feedback saying, okay, you didn't ask open-ended questions. You didn't listen well. Um, you, you missed, you know, what, whatever the feedback is. So it is a combination of content and tasks and activity because ultimately people learn by doing not by listening, they learn by doing. And so you wanna have as many doing activities as possible. And then the content supports and becomes scaffolding for and gives guidance to the activity. So that if, if, if the course says you need to, it gives you the four steps of a, you know, of a, an effective interview of a customer to gather, you know, do a needs analysis of what their problems are so you can solve it with a, a solution that you have, a product. Um, that training can provide that basic information so that then when you actually go out and perform the task, how much of it did you remember and actually implement it in the experience. So, Do you have an example or a sample of a micro-learning in that, in that way? I, I do. I, I don't have it part of this deck and it would probably take too long to pull it up, but I'd be happy to share that with somebody who's interested in a specific example of content and activities mixed together in a path to proficiency. Absolutely. All right. Excellent. There is a question from uh, someone that wants to know if eLearning Brothers has micro-learning templates, templates for micro-learning, um, give us a call. We'll, we'll put that up at the end, and we're happy to show you some of those templates. We do yeah. have those. Um, they're also um, somewhat built into our customizable courseware if you're trying to get into stuff like that. Um, but we have uh, a lot of things uh, that, that, that speak to this micro-learning. Yeah. Um, I don't see any other uh, questions at this time. Okay. Let me just share with you, um, let's, I'm gonna put this on the screen so that if some of you want to actually schedule some one-on-one -on -one time to address specific situations, I'd be happy to do that. Also, let me sort of reiterate, um, micro-learning, um, because of its nature, tends to increase the amount of design required compared to the amount of content uh, shared within a, a user experience. So design requirements go up. Otherwise, you've got, a, instead of a 60 minute page turning e-learning course, you've got a five minute page turning e-learning course. And that's not gonna have the impact that you're looking for. And it, and it doesn't provide the user experience um, to teach the level that you want. Because one, one of the principles was, is you, you know, you want to get as much leverage as you can, as bangs for your buck, um, with the investment in a five-minute experience. That's one of the that's one of the topics or one of the purposes of micro learning. And so, design requirements go up when you're doing micro learning. And so, um, getting into more engaging activities. Um, and just a classic example of this, um, where you a typical multiple choice question um, may be part of a micro learning activity. But what if you added the question of level of confidence when answering it? So it's two dimensional. And then if you, and if you can capture that data, then you can begin to see if there are gaps or uh, disconnects between they're getting all these right, but they're guessing them all, that type of thing. 
So th there are ways of raising a level of engagement and the level of um, information that you gather from an activity that may be considered very basic, multiple choice question and a micro learning activity. And it, it, that, that's one example of ways of gathering information and making, more, making the experience more relevant so you understand the user or the learner and gathering information that tells you, you know, we've got a problem here. They're getting them all right, but they're guessing. So we, we need to do a better job of training these people. Just one example. That is great. That is that is phenomenal. Um, so the information there on the screen, schedule a demo. Um, that phone number there on the screen is for Richard directly. Give him a call if you have more questions about this micro learning uh, experience and, and trying to trying to figure out how to make those work. Um, he's got lots more examples to show you. Like he, he mentioned, he doesn't have something built into this deck, but he's happy to show you those. Uh, so give us a call at that number. Uh, that'll that'll reach out to Richard. His email is also down there, rharman at elearningbrothers.com. Thank you so much, Richard. This has been great. I do want to talk about the right hand of the screen there for a moment. ELBX Online. This is a huge uh, webinar event that we're putting on. It's going to start on February 25th. We're going to do one webinar a day for six weeks, and each week is going to be focused on one topic. The first week is instructional design. The second week is XAPI. Uh, the third week is gamification and so on. So if you want to uh, you know, take a look at those, dig way deep. You can register for all five of the less of the courses, the uh, the webinars. They're all free, um, just like this one. You can just jump in and, and check it out. Uh, go to elearningbrothers.com, and then up at the top, there's a section labeled ELBX. Um, there's there's also our ELBX live event coming up on June 10th. It's not too early to register for that as well. You can also find that elearningbrothers.com, and then in the nav bar, you'll see ELBX there at the top. Thank you again, Richard. This has been great. Thanks, everybody, for joining us, and we'll see you guys next time. Good question. Thank you.